and sit down? Can I use that mic? Yeah, is that on still? Just talk into it for me. Yes. Cool. <laughs> My everything hurts from last night. <laughs> <laughs> sit down part way through this. <laughs> also going to take this out, it sits nice and loud. Okay, uh, is this working? Why my clicker not work? It's okay, I'll come to it, it's fine. Okay, cool. That doesn't want to work, mate. Oh, why did it, why did it work? Why did it work? Right, okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I, um, after the um, uplifting and incredible night we all uh, had last night, I'm here to thoroughly depress you. <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you um, about all the ways that we blame women and girls um, for being subjected to sexual violence. Um, and then, because um, I wanted to show you uh, a video before I get off, I'm going to um, do a bit of talking and then I'm going to show you a video. Hopefully the audio will work, uh, if not tough, and then you don't get the video. So, um, I'm going to talk to you about the ways that we blame women and girls and what um, the research is showing us at present, including my own research. Victim blaming is, is just really, really common. We know that the majority of women and girls that have been subjected to sexual violence or abuse will be blamed for being subjected to that violence um, or abuse. And you can see some of the examples of um, how we do this. However, as I'm going to show you through this presentation, it could be anything. There isn't really a set way that women and girls are blamed for sexual violence because you could be blamed for literally anything that suits the narrative at that time or suits the defence solicitor or suits the perpetrator or suits society. Um, so I'm going to show you some of the ways that we do that. So those are some examples of victim blaming and examples of self-blame. One of the, I guess, <laughs> One of the saddest things about self-blame and the way women blame themselves for sexual violence and abuse is that you don't actually have to have been blamed by somebody else to start blaming yourself. It is fairly common for a woman or girl to blame herself for being abused or trafficked or raped or assaulted from the moment that it happens. It doesn't necessarily mean that you went somewhere and somebody told you that you should have taken more responsibility or it was your fault or it was something you could have done differently because that will kick in before that, ju that external judgment. Victim blaming, um, in my research, I tend to come at it from three different angles, and we can use the same in um, self-blame. It's really useful for uh, just analyzing the way that people talk about women and girls. So victim blaming tends to start off behavioral. So the first thing that the media, the institutions, the police, CPS, health services, professionals, the first thing that gets attacked is your behavior. It is, could you have done something differently? Why were you there at that time? You know, why were you drinking? Why were you, there's all, all of the different behaviors that could possibly be blamed, that comes first. The attack on behavior is usually the, the first line of attack. When attacking your behavior does not work or doesn't fully blame you for that assault or rape or trafficking, the next thing that happens is characterological blame, which is the attack on character. That you're promiscuous, you're naive, you're stupid, you shouldn't have trusted that person. Um, however, as this has gone on and become more and more commonplace, and in some cases more and more palatable, what we now see is a mixture of characterological and behavioral blame. It's sort of like you shouldn't have been doing that and also you should have known what was coming next or whatever. Situational blame interests me because I see it a lot um, now. It's a lot more common and I think it's part of that um, trying to make victim blaming more palatable. So situational blaming is where you don't really blame the woman or girl. You sort of blame the situation she was in. So examples of that are things like when someone says, um, well, if you're going to go to parties like that, that's what happens at parties like that. I was like, the fucking party didn't attack her though, did it? <laughs> 
So it, it wasn't the party, it's not the hotel, it's not the taxi, it's not the dark street, it's not the, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not all of these situations that cause sexual assault and rape and violence, it's men. So we're not naming the problem. Situational blaming is almost like this cop-out where you don't name the offender. The offender gets erased from their own offence by being able to talk about how the situation caused this to happen. Like, oh, you know, if you're going to get into a taxi at two in the morning after having a drink, then you should know that that might happen. No, you shouldn't. Like, at all. But that's the way situational blaming works. However, we tend to see, like, quite a mixture of these now. The best way uh, that i found to look at victim blaming of women and girls is using an ecological model, even though that sounds sophisticated, it's not. Uh, most of the, um, I think most of the biggest theories in psychology and human development, they sound, um, the names of them sound really sophisticated and like somebody probably got like six promotions and like an 80 grand pay rise out of them. They're actually like, really simple. Uh, they still probably did get six promotions and an 80 grand pay rise out of them though. Um, so the ecological model's been being used since the 70s and it, the best way to explain it is that it's a way of making sure that you uh, look at all levels of society rather than just focusing on the individual. A lot of psychological research that looks at the victim blaming of women and girls tends to focus on the woman herself. Like, what is it about this woman or girl that meant that she was blamed? Was it her behaviour? Is it what she looks like? Is it where she was brought up? Is it, you know, her ethnicity? Is it her body type? But I preferred, when I was working, to look at all levels of society. And so there is actually about 60 years worth of research that can back up everything around my model here. So every word that's at the different system, the different level of society, every word that's around here has pretty much between, anywhere between about 10 and about 40 or 50 years worth of evidence that those things are encouraging or colluding with or um, causing the victim blaming of women and girls. So I'm gonna to talk to you, I'm gonna show you some of the evidence of that. The first one is rape myths. Now, most of you, if you have a look on the screen, may have, sort of feel really familiar with rape myths. We talk about it a lot. A lot of people um, have theorized that rape myths are the reason that we blame women and girls for sexual violence. I don't accept that. I think that rape myths are very important. I think they're feeding a narrative. I don't think they're the reason that we blame women and girls. I think it's a mixture of things, uh, which if you read my book or if you read the thesis, if you're a bit of a nerd and you want to read 420 pages of that, um, then it, it's, it is more complicated than that. But rape myths are definitely still affecting public perception. You can see there that recent studies have shown that between a third and a half of the general public do actually believe the things written on the screen. One of the major issues with that, of course, is that the general public make up juries. <laughs> um, so if you consider that potentially a third to a half of your jury on every trial may believe the things written on that board, you instantly have a very serious problem with that trial. Obviously, um, sexism and misogyny has been used to explain victim blaming of women and girls uh, since Martha Burt um, and since Brown Miller and people like that, which were 60s, sort of second wave feminists. Um, and I just want to pick up on a couple of these. Um, there's some statements here that really do feed into victim blaming. So one of them is, women and girls should act sexy but not slutty. <laughs> which is like this. You're supposed to be desirable but not too desirable. No, 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 because that's, that's a mistake. So society would expect you to get up in the morning, look attractive, look after yourself, present yourself well, but not too well because then you're asking for it. So you're supposed to be sexy enough that you'll be accepted, but not too sexy that you're actually drawing attention to yourself because then you're just gonna cause whatever is coming. And an example of that is these little weird things that we do, like um, that strange, like loads of women in this room are going to know what I mean when I say this. You know when you go, you can have your boobs out, but not your legs. But you can have your legs out, but not your boobs. You can't have them both at the same time because that's, that's just too much. It's 
too much. Yeah? That's sexy but not a slut. That's like, where is the balance here between me being a bit sexy but not too sexy? Um, so that's an example of that. It's like when women cross over that whatever that fucking imaginary bar barrier is there of like, too, whoa, too sexy, um, then you're in trouble. Women and girls should be sexually available, but also engage in token resistance. Research from the 80s showed that women and girls are expected to engage in token resistance, which is where you say no, even though you want it, sex, dating, whatever, because you don't want to appear easy. Now, one of my favorite ever studies, which probably wouldn't pass ethics now, <laughs> um, was Garcia's work in 1984, where they placed Confederate psycholo uh, psychology researchers in a bar. So they put women in a bar, and then they waited for men to just chat them up and hit on them and stuff, right? And then they had other psychologists in the bar that were just watching this study happen, and they were taking note of the men's behaviors. And, um, the, the women were given a set of escalating behaviours to show men that they weren't in interested. So one of them, the first one, was to just go, uh, I'm not interested, thanks. And then if that didn't work, which it didn't, um, <laughs> then they were supposed to get a little bit more assertive and go, look mate, not interested. And then if that didn't work, they were then supposed to move on to a set of behaviours and it was, there was about eight behaviours that they were to escalate to. My favourite is number four, which was, um, as the man was still chatting them up, to just do this. <laughs> oh, I would have bloody loved to be a fly on the wall in that study. Um, and then after that, she had to um, visibly get distressed. After that, she had to cry and then after that, she had to scream for help. And in that study, they actually approached the men afterwards and they interviewed them and was like, why didn't you stop on the first no? Uh, they found that the majority of men stopped when she cried. Oh. <laughs> and then when they interviewed them afterwards, they asked them why, and they said, because I thought she was just being coy. I thought she was just playing hard to get, so I carried on. That study was ex extremely important, but it also is important in victim blaming because it, um, it feeds into the issues we have around why no doesn't mean no. Um, also, although I've not got time to talk about it right now, it's also one of the reasons why I have real, a real issue with the consent education in schools at the moment because it's too simple. Just being yes. like, yes means yes, and no means no. Oh, great, that fucking works, doesn't it? <laughs> that no doesn't. So stop teaching them that. Start teaching them the nuances, right? Safety advice. Some of the things that are up there. Anti-rape wear is a thing now. We blame women by expecting them to wear ridiculous uh, items. So you've got the anti-rape knickers. You can look these up if you don't know what these are. They're now, they're being sold on Facebook. So if you, like, they come up sometimes and you just get your anti-rape knickers. They're basically a pair of knickers. They've got like a lock here. It's like a chastity belt, basically. Um, and you just like sort of, they have a lock here because um, the people who design them have absolutely no understanding of violence or abuse, obviously. Anti-rape bras, which I cannot tell you how they work um, because of the nature of rape and where a bra is on your body. <laughs> So I'm not sure how they work. <laughs> then you've got the anti-rape jewellery, which I'm fairly sure is illegal. So it's like a ring, a little knife comes out, a stab him. <laughs> and, then there's, and then there's the anti-rape necklaces, which is like a necklace and a little knife comes out and you stab him. <laughs> and then there's the anti-rape bracelets and a little knife comes out and you stab him. <laughs> um, and you can buy these online. I'm fairly certain we'd probably get arrested for using those um, and then blamed um, for, uh, for using your little anti-rape necklace during a rape. So then you've got rape self-defense classes, lots more research now suggesting that women should be taking rape self-defense classes, uh, which I categorically disagree with. Advice to women not to jog, walk, use headphones, use a train, eat, live or breathe in case they're attacked. There's more and more safety advice now. <laughs> Um, and probably not as funny, child sexual abuse charities in the UK now developing Keep Yourself Safe programmes for th children three and up to keep themselves safe from sexual abuse. I spoke to um, 
the CEO of a, a sexual violence organization this week, um, who told me that she had gone to the launch of a new program of a charity that everybody in this room knows that's called Resisting Grooming for Children, which they are now going to roll out in primary schools to teach children how to resist sexual grooming. Pardon? Do they mention fathers? Yeah, resist your father, Paul. <laughs> no, of course not. They don't mention men in these programs. Okay. We also teach victim blaming in our education system. One of the most damaging systems you can put a girl or a woman through is primary and secondary school. Um, and that's because of the um, inherent sexism that's within the education system. So when um, women, when, when little girls go to reception, um, and those of you who have children in the room will know that your kid changes significantly when they go to school. All of a sudden they start coming home and saying things like, I don't like girls, they're horrible. Oh, you fucking liked them in nursery, what happened then? Like, that's what happened to my kids. They say things like, I don't like playing with trucks because they're for boys. Oh, you played with trucks in nursery. Something happened. Now, we know from the research that that's something that's happening is that the entire education system and teachers do uphold gender role stereotypes and then they feed them to the children over a period of years. Yeah. Um, however, you can also see that this leads to much more serious issues. Um, schools banning school skirts because girls were being harassed by boys because the uh, obvious solution to that would be the skirts being banned. Schools banning the showing of female collarbone in the UK in 2016 and 2017 because it was distracting male teachers. You can look this up, it's all in the press, this, because... So we had here the um, complaints that girls were distracting male teachers from their jobs. I don't know about you, but if I was a head teacher in that school and a bloke came up to me and was like, can I have a, can I have a minute? Um, I'm a bit... I'm getting a bit distracted in my job because the girls' bodies are dist You know what I mean? Like the, the, like the legs and the collarbone and stuff. Yeah, I would, <laughs> I would have just suspended that bastard. Dead <laughs> quick. <laughs> they would not have had a job at any of that. The worry about that, of course, is that they didn't do that. A number of those head teachers actually went to the press and said, you know, we've got a real issue with this and we need to change our school uniform because girls' bodies are distracting male teachers. And that's not the response that we want at all. It's not the response we want for girls. Exactly. So you can see here just some of the stats um, from the Women and Equality Committee report published in 2016. 59% of girls have been sexually harassed at school. 29% of 16 to 18 year old girls had experienced unwanted sexual touching in school environment. Um, boys pulling down girls' trousers or lifting their skirts up was commonplace by the age of 10 years old. We have... Um, one of the highest numbers of, of rapes being committed on school campuses that we've ever had. Um, and so the education system and the way it's responding to it is definitely feeding into this. One of the things here um, that came out was that 50% of girls said that they would not tell their teachers if they were being sexually harassed or assaulted at school because it would not be taken seriously. Only 3% of teachers reported that they felt confident teaching or supporting students in this topic. So it means that even girls at primary school and secondary school age knew not to tell their teachers that they were being harassed or assaulted at school because no one's going to do anything about it anyway. When teachers were uh, interviewed about this, there was a um, very much a uh, sort of a thing like, boys will be boys, they don't mean it, they don't understand what they're doing, it's normal teenage behaviour type issue. You can't do a, a presentation like this without talking about porn. Um, and porn is having a massive impact on the way that we blame women and girls for sexual violence, um, especially because <coughs> the sexualization and objectification of women in porn dementalizes and dehumanizes women. So then when, we commit, when men commit offenses against women and girls, it's not seen as, as serious or it's not seen as, uh, as impacting them. Mass media, I can't go through all of these, but I am gonna show you something in a second. Um, 50% of media reports of rape describe a rape that occurred in a deserted public place committed by a stranger despite this only making up 3% of rape. So that's just one of the ways that the media is affecting um, our understanding of sexual violence. They deliberately pick out the rarest forms, the rarest assaults, the rarest rapes, the abductions, the, the sexual homicides, and then they make them sound as if they're commonplace. The other thing that they do is that they'll deliberately pick up any case 
that somebody has shouted false allegation at you. And then they over-report on those as if they're really common, which as you can see, um, even though we reckon, and even though you wouldn't know, that around 1% of reports to police are false allegations, the general public believe anywhere between 20% and a half of, false, of rape reports are false, generally when they have quite high exposure to the media. Okay, I am going to move on because I want to show you these. What this is... Okay, I didn't get as long as... I, I'm going to keep talking for a minute, okay? <coughs> so, um, we blame women even in awareness raising campaigns. This is the type of message that's going out to women and girls. You can... If some of you might not be able to see this right at the back. These are posters. That one says, stop, no, stop, please, no, please, please stop taking unbooked minicabs. One in three reported rapes happen when the victim has been drinking. This was commissioned by NHS England and the Home Office. This one's by Cabwise. This one on the end is Sussex Police. This one that's very um, unclear is Warwickshire Police and it says avoid being a rape victim that's written in blood. <laughs> rape, don't be a victim, drink sensibly. This is by uh, South Wales Police. All of these are messages to women and girls not to be a rape victim. So I'm gonna finish just here. I don't know if I now have time to show the video, but that's not, that's not too bad, I, I guess. I actually, there is no way that I could fit this into this presentation. That's why it feels rushed, because it is. So I wanna show you the list of all of the factors that I have shown um, are causing and colluding and encouraging the victim blaming of women and girls in society. Apparently you can't get away with writing that in a PhD. <laughs>